Good morning, church. My name is Brian Hoover. I will be a scripture reader for today. We're going to be reading from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. You can follow along on the one screen, or you can follow along in the Pew Bible on page 919. So again, we'll be in Ephesians 5. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not be even named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. This is the word of the Lord. Well, take a moment and consider this past week. The things you thought about. The words you spoke. The ways you used your eyes, ears, feet, and hands. All the things you wanted, whether dignified or depraved. Now, what would it be like if all of that was shown to a friend of yours or your spouse? What would it be like if it was projected onto the screens here? The prospect of being fully known can be terrifying. We're inclined to believe that if people really knew who we were, they'd run the other way. They'd stop calling, stop texting, or they'd hand you the wedding ring you gave them many years ago. But as scary as it is, we long to be known, to be both known and loved permanently, without regret or wavering. In other words, we long for pure love, a love that only God can truly offer. No one will see us like he does, and no one can love us like he can. We long for an intimate love that will last in all of our relationships, in our friendships, in the family bonds we share. And one of the deepest expressions of this longing for relational intimacy is through our sexuality. As we consider Ephesians 5, we're gonna be reflecting on God's gift of sexuality. And when we do so, we enter sacred ground. For our sexuality is holy. And this conversation is profoundly important, especially right now, but not primarily because of the way that it's been twisted by sin, but because of its beauty and holiness as a creation of God. I want to offer a few brief comments before we jump in. You may have a story in which sexual harm or sin is its primary theme. You may have a story that haunts you with a shame that swallows you up every time you face it, or a guilt 
that makes you unable to fathom that the gospel could be true for you. If that is you, the Lord sees you. He knows you. And this morning, he wants to minister to you as only he can. To that end, and much more, let's pray. Holy, holy, holy are you the Lord God Almighty. We bow before your holiness and your goodness and your beauty and we ask that as we uh, sit here uh, in these next few moments that you would shine upon us. That you do what only you can do that you would have mercy upon me, that if there's things that I say that are, that are off or make them forgotten, if there's things that are, that are right and true, Lord, that are in step with your word, make them to, to fall upon us in such a way that will redeem us. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we walk through Ephesians 5 this morning and consider sexuality, we're going to consider three different things. Number one, the holiness of sexual union. Number two, the tragedy of sexual ruin. And number three, the only hope for healing. Number one, the holiness of sexual union. When painting an image or a shaping a sculpture, an artist takes great care in his act of creation. Every stroke of a brush, every strike of a chisel, every scan of the canvas or the clay are pregnant with potential and a power to make something beautiful. A piece of art is a window into a beauty beyond itself which always flows out of and points back to the artist. Well, God is the great artist. The cosmos is his canvas. He made the world. He made you. And like an artist, he has placed his signature upon you. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 1, if you have a Bible. If you're in the Pew Bible, it's probably uh, very early, uh, page number-wise. I don't know the exact page number. Maybe one. I don't know. But turn with me uh, to Genesis chapter 1. At the climax of God's creation of the world, we read this in Genesis 1, starting in verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Going down to verse 30, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. In these verses, we see what it means to be human. God crafted you and I in his image with perfect dignity and honor, intimately known and loved, made to bow to his love in everything. He gave us a purpose, like a king who would craft statues of himself in outlying provinces of his kingdom to point to and remind his people of his good reign. So God has crafted us as pieces of art, portraits of himself made to point to his good grain in the world. So what does it mean then that in the same breath we hear that God made us male and female? Well, it means that to be human is to be sexual in body, mind, and soul. We often think about sexuality in terms of sexual desire or attractions or activity Our sexuality is not first and foremost defined by our sexual desires. 
our sexual history, or our sexual future, but by the holy dignity given to us by God as both men and women, males and females. God made us different, and that is very good. Though God made each of us with the same dignity, the same purpose, he made us different in our bodies and our souls. Though each one of us can bear witness to God's beauty and his good kingdom in some mysterious way, it is only together as males and females, men and women, that we can fully bear witness to the beauty of God. And that's true of, here, of us here at community. As brothers and sisters, we need one another to see the love of God in Jesus Christ. We will not fully see it without one another. Sex is not the ultimate expression of our sexuality, but it is a primary one, the most intimate one, such that we long to know and love one person as intimately as we possibly can. Ultimately, in sacred sexual union. If we go to a few verses later in Genesis 2, following God's creation of the world, God's creation of Adam, God puts lonely Adam into a deep sleep. He takes out one of his ribs and then creates Eve. In verses 23 to 25, we read this. Then the man said of Eve... This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. And they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. This is a deeply passionate moment. In context, Adam's saying, finally, I'm not alone. Finally, I'm not surrounded by animals. Not the greatest compliment to pay to your betrothed on your wedding night, right? But he goes on in ecstasy. She's like me, finally. And she's not like me. We were made for one another. Adam's ravished by Eve. And when Adam saw her, he loved her. And they became one flesh, one man, one woman, beautifully different as one. And this wasn't a one-night stand. And it wasn't enjoyed for all to see, but was given and received in a covenant. Adam laid hold to her with integrity, with self-giving love, and a promise of permanence. And Eve did the same. Their sexual union wasn't the foundation of their relationship, but it was the passionate expression of their covenant love for one another. Adam and Eve were both naked and not ashamed, naked in both body and soul, completely known and completely loved. Just as we ourselves were made as images of God, so covenantal sexual union was made to be a sign of something beyond itself. Sexual union, as God made it to be, is not ultimately about the pleasure that it brings or the passion that it stirs. Sex is meant to point to something beyond itself, namely the intimate love of God. In a marriage, sex is not just a collision of bodies but a joining of souls whose love for one another takes them deeper into one another and ultimately deeper into the holy embrace of God. And true covenantal sexual union can only take place between a man and a woman, for only a man in body and soul can pursue and touch the deepest place of a woman. And only a woman can fully embrace the most sacred part of a man. In this way, a husband and a wife function as distinct images of God for one another in their sexual union, showing one another just how much God sees them, knows them, and loves them in their deepest soul. 
And in the gospel, Paul explains the deeper meaning of sexual union. This mystery is profound, he says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. A husband was made to show his wife the self-giving love of Jesus as he pursues her, to give to her, to know her, to abide with her. And a wife radiates the beauty of the church as she receives and embraces the love of her good husband. This is holiness. It is very good. So how do we honor it? How do we operate as a people that honor the holiness of sexuality? Well, we protect and we uphold it. Both of which require that we speak about it. We refrain from talking about sex flippantly, casually, or frivolously. Paul says in Ephesians 5, verse 4, Let there be no foolishness or filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. He's commenting about sexuality here. Thanksgiving is the way to honor our sexuality. So we don't talk about it flippantly, but we need to talk about it in the right places, with the right people, for the right reason. One of the places in which I think we need to push ourselves is in our families, specifically with our children. To be honest, when I've talked with those in my generation, I have heard that generally their parents only talk to them one time about sex. And that was when they hit puberty. And what was communicated was, don't do it. Until marriage. Which then bears the fruit that marriage is kind of the ultimate thing. They were unprepared for what was about to hit them. Now, we teach young kids about basic math, right? One plus one equals two. So that they can better prepare to learn geometry and algebra and maybe calculus. It's essentially mathematical discipleship. We do that with math, but when it comes to sex, we can be silent until they're 16, and then they're expected to understand sexual calculus. This can be so awkward, totally. uh, Benjamin and I were just talking about the Everyone Loves Raymond uh, show where he's trying to talk to his daughter about sex. It can be awkward. It can be hard because it's a holy thing, and yet we've got to do it. We need our children to know the beauty of sexual union and where it belongs so that they will be able to spot its counterfeit and be ready to make sense out of their own sexuality. We need help to do this. We need help to teach our children about sex. At least I do. And there's resources to help in this, and some of them are in this room. Some of you need to teach me how to do this. Seeing the holiness of sexual union. And now number two, the tragedy of sexual ruin. In our home, we have a special piece of art that hangs over our kitchen table. It takes up most of the wall. It's kind of hard to miss. It's a swirl of colors, red, yellow, gold, shining out of a swirl of black. Inevitably, we happily explain this to our visitors. We did so just last night. It's a very meaningful piece of art for us. It was a community art piece that was made by men and women that are very dear to us. Now consider what it would be like if one of our guests, after hearing us explain uh, how meaningful this special piece of art was, took the leftover food on our plates and smeared it across the painting. Scraped off paint here and there. Started doing their own thing. And when stopped, all that they say is, I think I can make it better. I'd be, I'd be hard-pressed to not throw them out of the house, right? 
It'd be hurtful. They desecrated something that was really meaningful to us. God's given us the good gift of sexuality and rather than receiving that gift with thanksgiving and honoring it and, and others with it, like our house guest with our painting, we're inclined to take it for ourselves. Do what we want with it. We make God's gift a God. And when we do, we fashion it in our own image, shaped by our sexual longings. I'm told that I must express my sexual longings in order to be my truest self, that I'm defined by them. In sin, we reject God as the artist of sex, and instead of submitting to the meaning, purpose, and boundary lines he has set, we look to our sexual desires to guide us, and as we follow them, we're led into ruin. We see this play out in our culture's posture towards sex. Men and women make sex, which was made to point to the love of God, into a sign that points to themselves. They labor to be seen as sexually attractive. They manicure their image to allure that man or woman of their dreams. And we join the current and say, if I could only be intimate with the right person the man or woman of my dreams, then I wouldn't feel like there's something deeply wrong with me. Or I wouldn't be so lonely. Or I wouldn't be listless in life. And this even extends to the sacred covenant of marriage. When sex is God, marriage can be a prison. Especially when your spouse is not what you want them to be or you're not as satisfied as you hoped. Adultery becomes the norm. Divorce becomes not a legitimate response to the breaking of a covenant, but a liberation from waning romance. Pornography offers instant gratification without true intimacy, without being known, without commitment or relational obligation. Paul speaks about this whole dynamic when he says in Romans 1, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. Any sexual activity outside of the sacred covenantal union of marriage between a man and a woman is a tragedy and an affront to God. Adultery and premarital sex, or to use the biblical term, fornication, or a violation, a desecration against God's holy gift. Casual sex degrades sex. When two men or two women attempt to unite sexually, it's a violation of God's heart for sex. Even more, sexual activity between two men or two women fails to fulfill the ultimate purpose of sexual union, which is to bear, wor- bear witness to the diverse union between Jesus and his bride. And we see that the deification of sexual expression play out in our culture's posture toward identity. Gender and sexual identity. There are men and women who endure the excruciating pain of gender dysphoria such that they have to wake up every morning feeling torn apart in their soul. We got to take stock of that experience as we enter into this conversation. And yet when our culture affirms the transition of a man to a woman, a boy to a girl, or vice versa, it affirms the dishonor of God's artistry and his design for our identity as men and women. These issues are complex in so many ways, and yet biblically they are clear. And when we make our sexual fulfillment everything, we make sex next to nothing. Sex becomes currency. 
cash to exchange for the fulfillment, fulfillment we long for. Sex becomes a commodity to be bought and sold or stolen. Men and women don't come together to know, love, and honor one another's dignity, but to consume it for their own pleasure and power. We can see this out there in something like hookup culture. Yet this can characterize sexual union even in a marriage. In the church, we can believe that if a couple is married, then they can't engage in sexual sin. But marriage doesn't automatically sanctify sex. For example, a husband, even a Christian husband, can sin against his wife by using her for his own satisfaction. The degradation of sex is most apparent, maybe in the porn industry, where sex is literally a monetized performance. Pornography is not harmless either. A frightening amount, and some statistics say the majority of sexual content online is either physically or verbally violent, or both. And if we knew the extent and the effect of this industry, I think we would crumble. I think we would all be weeping here in this room. And so does the Lord. And even more, when sex is our savior, it inevitably enslaves us. Sexual addiction is more prevalent, powerful, and profoundly painful than we think. Men and women who are facing sexual addiction face a monster that has sunk its claws in them. In the light of day, our culture boasts of its sexual freedom. But in darkness, men and women are bound in slavery. Are you languishing in darkness? Or are you comfortable with it? Paul offers blazing words in Ephesians 5, verses 3 to 6, that Brian just read. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Paul writes something very similar to the church in Corinth. He writes, in chapter 6, verse 9, do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Paul's words are so severe. But God's wrath is a sign meant to point us to what he finds precious. And if you treat his treasure like trash, then you warrant his wrath. God's wrath reveals his ferocious love, his tenacious commitment to protecting the dignity of those he has made. Sexual immorality desecrates the holy more than we could imagine. For the commodification of sex is not benign. When sex is a commodity, when sex is cash, someone's always got to pay often with their own dignity, whether they are willing or not. Sexual abuse wreaks havoc on a person's soul. 
transforming their honor into humiliation, their dignity into shame. Intimacy becomes harm. Love becomes a lie and gentleness a dream. The severity of sexual trauma and its life-altering effects shows us just how holy sexuality is. But this morning, we have good news. Good news in Jesus Christ. We've seen the holiness of sexual union, the tragedy of sexual ruin, and we see the only hope of healing in Ephesians 5. I don't know about you, but I behold the tragedy of sexual ruin, ruin, and I'm without words. Even as I was preparing this sermon, I, I, I was stunned into silence. What do I do? How do I face sexual sin and suffering, whether it's in those I love, those that I see in the world, or in my own life? Whether it's porn addiction or sexual abuse or the inner distress of being same-sex attracted and having to listen to those words. Or whether it's the roar of hate and ridicule, sometimes coming from Christians in the world surrounding sexuality. We are easily overwhelmed by sexual brokenness. What do we do? Paul says to us, walk as children of light. Beloved children. For, in in Ephesians 5 verse 13, when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. It's not a grammar error. Anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. We engage our culture not as warriors or bystanders, but as children, children of light. And the light we bear is much more like a lantern lit up to light up the night to find what is lost than it is a flame meant to burn up everything in its path. In the name of truth. As Paul calls us to do, we refuse to be partners with those who champion sexual immorality, whether outside in the world or inside the church. Yet we labor and long with humility and gentleness and boldness to see them won over to the truth. Christians have become known purely for what they're against rather than the the beauty that we we boast in, which is self-giving, covenantal, intimate love. In other words, the love of Christ. For Jesus offers a hope that lifts up our heads and embraces us in our deepest shame. The only way forward for the sexually stained, the sexually broken, the only way forward for all of us is through light. As children of light, we expose the darkness as Paul calls us to do. But we start with our own. We confess our own sin. If you're bound to sexual sin this morning, run to the light. Like your life depends on it, because it does. There is good news in the light. As painful as the initial searing of light might be, it ultimately brings Transformation. Take the risk of walking in the light to a trusted friend 
or mentor. If you're dissatisfied in your marriage and drawn away from your spouse, run, run to the light. Run to somebody that you trust, somebody that's proven their trustworthiness to you and and bring it out into the open. The stakes are too high. And if you remain riddled with guilt over your past, receive the grace of God this morning. Receive the grace of God through a friend. And labor to take Jesus at his word. In him, you are spotless before your heavenly father. Spotless forever. If you're grappling with same-sex attraction, you have been on my heart this week. We love you. Take courage and share with someone, again, who has proven that you can trust them. If you face sexual shame, you also have have been on my heart. And I've been praying that you would know the heart of Christ, which is otherworldly, kind, and safe. He will never take advantage of you. Whether it's a counselor or a safe brother or sister in Christ, as you're ready, let the darkness see the light of day. We cannot do this on our own, but we need others to shine the light of Christ to us, to bear God's image to us. This is how we're redeemed in Christ, the searing truth and the supernatural love of Christ. In other words, we are known and loved in all of our sin and shame, and we are known and loved out of it. The light of Christ changes everything. His gaze, just his gaze, can turn darkness into light. He doesn't just do away with it. He doesn't just take us back to where we were. He changes it. And he makes it an agent of grace, an image pointing to his beauty. He can change sexual shame into beauty. Wounds no longer fester and function as reminders of wrong, but they serve as images of the hope and healing power of God's safe embrace. I have seen this happen in the lives of others, and I've seen it happen in my own life. Jesus has made us and given us a new family, a place in which whether we are young or old, married or single, we're struggling, we can be known, loved, satisfied, and transformed into our beautiful Savior. And in Jesus, as we turn to him, we indeed can have the inheritance of heaven. We boast not in ourselves, but in the gospel of Jesus Christ that Paul declares immediately following his long list of sexual sins and sexual depravity. He says, and such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Let's pray. Father, Shine your light upon us. Do what only you can do, Lord. If there are are people in this room that um, you are subtly convicting to come into the light, Lord, give them courage, supernatural courage. Bring a name to mind.
of somebody that they can talk to, whether here in our church or in their life. Lord, for those who are suffering around this, Lord, give them your favor, your supernatural favor, that they would know that you see them, that you know them, and you cherish them, and that you want to draw them in to the loving embrace of Jesus Christ. And Lord, for those of us that um, have been redeemed, that have a past that, that you have washed Help us to rejoice in it and celebrate it. And Lord, as we go, that you would um, open up our eyes and our hearts to see the magnificent beauty of sexuality and how you made us and what it's for and where it belongs. And give us grace as we walk as children of light. In Jesus' name, amen.